Good evening and welcome to this event of the series Delicious. Under this name, the Instituto Cervantes Centers in the United Kingdom, Leeds, London, and Manchester have developed a whole program of events around Spanish gastronomy and wine culture that will take part throughout the year. This program has a dual purpose. One, on the one hand, the, to further knowledge and appreciation of the traditions and the most innovative trends in Spanish gastronomy. And on the other, the support, the work carried out by the various people of the industry who are greatly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we have the great honor to present the book Taste of Barcelona, the History of Catalan Cooking and Eating, written by Susie Song and Anna Riera. Thank you very much, Anna and Susie, for accepting our invitation. It is a great honor to have you with us. Food is a powerful uh, connection tool. We build our bonds with friends and family over dinners, we go to restaurants on dates, we prepare food for others and with others, even when we are cooking and eating alone, food that still connects us to the world. Like music and literature, food is a shared cultural experience. No matter the culture, the preparation of food is very similar, the uh, ritual is also very similar. And uh, when we talk about uh, food with people, we typically hear more about traditions, cultural differences and similarities and relationships through the exchange of receipts. These ideas of sharing common cultural experiences and forging bonds through food is a key topic in the book we are presenting tonight. This journey into Catalan cuisine aims to provide a culinary history of the region from medieval Spain to the most avant-garde scene in contemporary Barcelona. It's analysis that is not typically found in guide, uh, guidebooks and it's what makes this book absolutely unique and fascinating. Widely associated with avant-garde gastronomy and lavish food markets, Barcelona has become a top destination for commands and chefs around the world especially after the spectacular rise of the chef Ferran Adria and the famed El Bulli. Barcelona is a city that attracts millions of visitors in search of art and culinary experiences, while kitchens apprentices from around the world arrive looking to perfect the skills and expand their gastronomic horizon. A cosmopolitan city since origin, Due to its geographical uh, location, Barcelona represents <coughs> sorry <coughs> of the best of the Mediterranean cultural mix: Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Jews. The traces of history are very present, which are also especially evident in food. For example, the tomato that came from America, or after the wine and rum created in cities. Catalonia and from there it conquered the world. The book that we are presenting make up of several uh, six uh, beautiful written chapters as you will discover throughout our conversation with the authors. I will now introduce the two uh, writers. First of all, Professor Roxy Song holds as chair in Hispanic studies in Durham University, a specialist in 20th and 21st century Spanish culture and literature. She's author of Lost in Tradition, Constructing Memory in Contemporary Spain, and also she's a co-editor co the Traces of Cont Contamination, Unearthing Francoist Legacy in Contemporary Spanish Discourse, and towards a cultural achievement the La Movida, Back to the Future. She is one of the serious editors of Culinaria, a new book series from the University of Toronto Press, and food, on food studies and says on the editorial board for Toronto Iberic series as well. Ana Riera teaches food studies at, Oli, uh, at Oliva University in Barcelona, where she started the first graduate program in astronomic and uh, technological communication in Spain. 
She also lectures on food and communication at the Universitat de Barcelona through her long trips through South America, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. She has examined the close relations between landscape and local food culture. She shared this experience in her radio program, Quinam in Nonda Cero, Catalonia, a frequent participant and speaker in astronomy conference, conferences throughout Spain. Since 2004, she works in the direction and writing of the newspaper magazine Gourmet, published by El Periódico de Catalonia. So we are now starting a dialogue and uh, with the authors. Our aim is that it would be something informal to enjoy the conversation. And uh, first of all, also, uh, we would like to have your participants uh, from the audience with your question through our chat. Uh, after, uh, when you put the questions, I will ask the, the, the authors, and uh, I hope we will have a lively conversation all together. Uh, my first question is um, for both. Uh, welcome again, and thank you very much for being with us. It's a great honor, as I said. And uh, how did you come up with the idea of writing the book, and what was the process like? Okay, do you mind if I start, Anna? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Pedro Jesus, uh, for inviting us, Anna and me, to share our book uh, with at the Instituto Cervantes. Um, and for including us in your delicioso series uh, with the uh, Instituto Cervantes in Manchester, Leeds in London. Uh, we're sorry we can't be there personally, but hopefully um, in the future, future maybe. <laughs> in the future we can create uh, a space where there will be not only conversation, but also something to eat and drink as well, which is the topic of our book. Um, so, the book actually uh, came together because um, there uh, was uh, a series um, called Big uh, City Food Biographies directed by a professor of food studies, Ken Albala, who teaches at the University of the Pacific. And uh, he had this idea that cities are very important in the way that uh, their stories are told can also be intrinsically linked to the food that its people eat. Um, so it's not a guidebook, but it is a way of thinking about the city, the people, the changes that um, a city undergoes physically, right? Through its history, uh, through neighborhoods, uh, through buildings, through areas of development and so on, people that arrive and leave uh, the cities um, and can be connected to food practices as well. So it's a way to get to know a city through its food practices. Um, and this was a, a, a series that started uh, with American cities like New Orleans, Miami, San Francisco, and so on. And given the global nature of our world uh, that we suddenly have discovered that is sort of, it, it's been in hiatus last, uh, since last year, uh, they wanted to expand internationally as well. And one of the areas of great interest was actually Spain. Uh, so I believe that you will be hosting uh, the author of the Madrid book, Maripaz Moreno. Uh, who I think is also uh, among the listeners this afternoon. Um, and they were also interested in a work on Barcelona. Um, and actually I was talking with Maripaz and she said, hey, you know, uh, why don't you get in touch with the editor and uh, pitch a book for Barcelona? And uh, I had just finished a collaboration with Anna where we actually took a bunch of students from my university to Barcelona on a food experience trip connected to a course. Um, so we started uh, talking and um, we decided to pitch the project together and you got accepted and uh, we uh, wrote it together. So perhaps Anna can uh, explain how it was for her uh, to think about this project uh, from her uh, background and actually working um, 
from two different parts of the world, right? Because she's in, based in Barcelona and I was actually, when writing this book, based in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, sorry for my voice, I hope it's clear. I am having a hard time this week with all the climate changes. No, we, are, um, we hear you perfectly, you. no problem at all. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so it was very interesting because when Rosie and I first got in touch, I was still living in Barcelona, but um, that we actually wrote the book while I was while I moved to California for a year and a half almost, and it was nice because so it looked like it, we were writing this book. It was in English. It was for for Roman and Littlefield, which is an American editorial, as you know, and it was interest, interesting because I was also able to step back from my city after being for more than at that time, 15 years working with chefs and, and restaurants and wineries in, 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 from the journalist perspective in explaining what was going on in the city of Barcelona and Catalonia in Spain as well. So it was very interesting because for us, the journalist, when we write an article, it's, it's maximum a two, three page, right? And this, was the, this book was, it took us a long time because, uh, well, not so long, a couple of years, no, Rosie, to write it. A year in the end, uh, the writing was a, a year. Uh, so it's it's different because you really you really uh, are able to explore in depth. And for me, this was a very interesting part from the book because my conversation from the chefs were was was not only about what they were doing or, or what they would do in the future, but also where they come from, how their recipes had evolved. Uh, how they had changed through the years. We could compare them from the from the medieval times when they started, when Manja Blanc, for example, the recipe that we will talk about started, how the, the chefs had evolved and transformed this recipe and were serving it nowadays. So it was super interesting for us. And also I think when you write a book like this, Rosie had come to Catalonia, Rosie speaks perfect Catalan, perfect Spanish. She had come to Barcelona, I, I saw her, many, many times because she was all the time going back and forth from Philadelphia to Barcelona when we would still travel <laughs> before the pandemic. And it was very interesting because we were able to work together in Barcelona, then work together in the States online because I was in California, she was in Philadelphia. And then we came back to Barcelona and also were able to finish the last part of the book together here. So it, the process was super, super interesting. For at least for me, and I learned so much. So it's a yes. great opportunity to now the journalism is not so much about investigation anymore. It is super interesting to have the space and also to share with Rosie that she's an academic and she's really, you know, used to going deep. And uh, yeah, that was a magnificent experience. And, and perhaps I can add just a little bit to that experience that Anna was talking. I think that indeed her experience of actually stepping out of Barcelona and seeing Barcelona from the outside gave us a very interesting, started a very interesting conversation about how do we communicate Catalan cuisine to a non-Catalan, a non-Spaniard. So we talked a lot about issues of translation and also how we could make connections with already existing food practices that people could relate to, to actually get a better understanding of the type of cuisine and food practice that we're trying to capture in this book. Yeah. Yes, and that is related also to the, to the, the next uh, question. I would like to put this, uh, your profile is similar, but it's also different. You know, how was the authors, if you have already spoke about it, but considering your experience, you no, know, uh, Ross is more uh, academic above all, but Anna is academic also teacher, but also journalist and in contact with the professional and the industry. So the, the co-authorship, I, I, I can suppose it was very interesting as you had said, but we provide some points uh, from, uh, uh, different. How, how was it to coordinate and to put it together the two uh, analysis I also? I, I, I would like to say, Rose, if it's okay with you, um, to add to this, 
uh, Pedro Eusebio, it was very interesting because a lot of people in the end collaborated with us in the book, right, Rosie? When we asked the chefs, could you share some recipes with us? We talked with Ferran Adria, with Juan Roca. Uh, when we asked them, when we asked the restaurants, what's the story of the restaurant in Can Luis, for example, they would explain the, 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 the sons of Can Luis now would explain us how their mom and dad, you know, just the personal stories that are behind the restaurant. So many people shared not only the, their knowledge, but also their way of living our gastronomy. And it was super interesting to, to share that as well as authors, right, Rosie? Because it's been, it's a, it's been gastronomy is very generous in, ge in general, right? I mean, it all happens around the table. We share our plates here in Catalonia. In Spain, you know, we have the tapas, which is the typical way of eating with freedom because you all share little things from here, from there, many, many plates. And I think, yeah, this, this generosity was, is, is also, we could translate that in the book through, for example, this, this whole chapter of recipes that they were so, you know, it was so keen in sharing with us um, and their chefs that they travel the world, they don't have time, you know, and uh, that was super interesting. And putting together, we're, we're very, I'm very grateful that Rose is very much more well organized than I am. <laughs> so this was, this was easy more, she made it easy. <laughs> she made it easy for all of us, for both of us. Perhaps in that sense, what we brought was um, I was looking or I was very happy that Anna was um, part of the project because she kept me sort of grounded uh, with what was happening in the city. So I think that perhaps the way I can uh, tell how this sort of project came together was that I provided perhaps a little bit more of a historical and cultural framework from where or to, to where we could insert these stories. So there was a lot of sort of uh, thinking about what were some of the stories that we wanted to tell, what were some of the aspects that we wanted to highlight. And then I would go back and sort of think about a story or a skeleton, right? Uh, for a chapter or for a topic that I could lay down and then we could sort of fit these stories into. So in that sense, I think that uh, there was a lot of research gone into uh, the writing of this book, but also there's a lot of sort of check, constant check between, is this something that is still going on? Is this something that is relevant to remember, to understand Catalan cuisine? And before Anna left Barcelona to do her uh, year in California, she did a lot of walking and calling and visiting. She did a lot of that groundwork that I wasn't able to do because I wasn't there physically. Mm -hmm. So I think that as we explained in the, in, in, in the introduction, I think it really came together as a combination of, uh, you know, sort of a very traditional academic research kind of work combined to with sort of that practical every day talking with people trying to connect what we know through books but that is still relevant right in everyday experience so in that sense we hope that uh people reading uh the book will have the sense that they're understanding some of the history but also it's still live it matters uh and it will help them uh if they make it to barcelona or at least have the chance to to try something, right, that is presented to them as belonging to Catalan uh, culture or Spain in general. Sorry, that's what I mentioned in uh, my introduction. Yeah, that what makes uh, the, 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 the book so interesting and fascinating to, to, to read is this uh, Parallel, the in-depth uh, intellectual uh, analysis of history, the circumstances, what uh, have been the evolution in history of the, of the, uh, of the culinary, uh, the gastronomy of uh, Catalonia, and uh, at the same time, the lively atmosphere that is communicated through the pages of the book. And that makes it uh, very, very, very uh, interesting and very, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you, you have a good time reading it uh, because uh, there are personal stories. There are many, many things, a lot of details 
and it's a good, very good reflect of the Mediterranean way of life in general. No, is it going uh, uh, the importance of uh, going out with friends and so. Uh, uh, the last question about uh, the, the process of uh, preparing the book. Uh, will you mention, uh, how you, I, I suppose you have some influences of models or references for, for, the, uh, for the preparing the, the book. Um, could you tell us about it? Sure, um, I'll take this one. Um, I think that, um, okay, so because the book belongs uh, to a book series, actually the parts of the book are pretty rigid, right? So there is a historical part that all books have. They they had there's a, a chapter on restaurants, a very important restaurants that have helped shape um, a city, right? So that a very historical look into uh, restaurants. Uh, there is a sample recipe chapter. So those things, those blocks are there that we needed to. Uh, go. I mean, we had a lot of freedom what we wanted to do with those chapters, but the, that that uh, framework was already established by the book, uh, the book series. In the case of models, I think that um, Catalan cuisine actually had a lot of good narrators uh, in its history, right? Uh, there is a very big and long tradition of cookbooks uh, in Catalonia. In fact, one of the earliest cookbooks uh, in the peninsula actually is uh, the Sensovi, um, and there are manuscripts left, uh, so you can trace it way back. I think that part of the inspiration that we got to sort of model these stories actually belong to more modern uh, narrators, Nestor Luján, Manuel Vázquez Montalban, Jaume Fabrega. Uh, these are key people that really have um, uh, crafted a way of talking about uh, Catalan food. And I think especially uh, Vasquez Montalban, uh, and I don't know if some of our listeners know him, he is a 20th century uh, Spanish writer, very prolific. He is the author of a very popular detective series called Pepe Carvalho. Uh, and he really uh, made talking about food and thinking about food, part of a cultural, um, uh, a popular uh, literature, right? Um, so we had a lot of sort of those models, how to tell stories. What were some of the things that were said about uh, Catalan cuisine or how it's communicated uh, in its particularities? Uh, and I think that writing from that sort of regional perspective, it was really important to understand the context of Spain, but also to think about what makes this cuisine particular, right, within that shared tradition as well. Uh, so I think that we had good models. Uh, and I think that also Anna, and you can jump in here if you want, but she was already all um, working in, in media, right? Uh, and it's all about sort of presenting uh, this type of food. And I think that she was also very familiar with this language that needed, that was needed to make uh, talking about food fun uh, and, and, and sexy, you know, in a way, um, and, and, and entertaining. Yeah, totally, totally. Nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just explained yes. it so well. <laughs> Okay, um, so speaking about history, the second chapter of the book describes the fascinating world of Catalan gastronomy in the Middle Ages. Rossi, could you tell us a bit about that world, how the relation with food was conceived and how that's influenced the later generations? Uh, this, uh, you have already mentioned one of the pillars of the books of the uh, medieval gastronomy, but uh, how was the, this uh, relations with food and uh, thought and conceived and how has influence also to the later generations? I think that um, in addition to the manuscript that I mentioned, clearly there are other manuscripts such as the Libra del Coq, um, el uh, Libra de Menjar de Pares, and so on. 
um, I think that uh, what uh, for me was really interesting to discover while we started looking at these medieval traditions of cooking is how much of it it's still used and it still prevails in today's cooking. Um, one of the interesting things to discover was that the diet hasn't changed that much. Um, that people in the Middle Ages were eating a lot of the same um, uh, um, vegetables that we eat today. Uh, clearly, later there are additions that come from the New World, obviously. Uh, but uh, there is a sense that um, the things, the, the pr products from that area that was being eaten hasn't changed a great deal. So that was a really interesting um, realization. Um, people enjoyed food. Uh, clearly, uh, there was a much more connection uh, between eating and uh, for medicinal purposes as well. I think that uh, back in the day, people were very worried about what they were eating or how they're going to um, 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 address their health issues, right? Which I think is actually ironic, not ironic, but interesting to, to see that we're sort of come full circle because now we talk a lot about food and health uh, again. Um, so some of those connections have been really uh, interesting to discover um, because they have prevailed in a way and we are rescuing some of that conversation again and sort of this idea of thinking about food in terms of um, um, improving our health or taking care of ourselves or as part of a tradition has not changed that much. So that history has been uh, a really interesting one to follow. I think, I think Anna, yes, uh, on the, I think <clears throat> one of the of the chapters we discussed the most. Do we put this? We do we do we add this? Uh, is this part of the history? Is it not? For example, the 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 restaurant chapter was really a thing for us because you know Barcelona is is a city that reinvents herself all the time. It's like an obsession, right? And in the restaurant point of view, in the restaurant scene, is exactly the same. So it's amazing. You you leave from Barcelona for a year and a half, like I did to California. You come back and it's like, oh my god, you know, I I can go to new restaurants forever now because it's like so many new restaurants. Of course, some of them close. We will get into that. Uh, we have we have had some important uh, losses uh, this time and during the pandemic. Very very. Uh, um, famous and historical restaurants like Agut, for example, uh, is closed for good. We have that in, in our chapter, but it was it was very um, difficult to decide. Okay, we wrote the chapter, for example, I remember writing about Carlos Gatch, Rosie Song, remember? A medical restaurant here, Gatch. And just when we're about to go into, into the edition, then Carlos Gatch moves from Barcelona and uh, goes to cook to uh, Bolvida Sardaña, to a Hotel Mercer, to a different location and closes his restaurant here. So this was probably right because it's it's really hard. And I think you will agree, Rosie. And, and the hardest part is to have these two profiles, um, the history and the actual scene to, to survive and to merge in a natural fluid way and make it interesting. And you know, not that someone that will read the book in five years will not say, "Oh, this is what," right? So that was probably the the a little bit of uh, the hardest part for us, and we discussed and discussed about it. Remember, Rose, and it's and of course you always miss uh, some restaurant or you always miss a chef that you are not able to book because it, the list was enormous, enormous, and. Um, that, that I, I, I can recall that this was one of the things, one of the uh, challenges of the book, right, Rosie? Yes, and I think that perhaps just to go back to that question of the tradition, it is when you think about writing about contemporary, um, what is happening right now, and think what will remain, right, and consider what you have from the past, 
um, it really, uh, it's amazing what survives, right? And um, how some things or elements stay constant. Um, so it was interesting to be in that um, sort of contradictory moment in which you find Barcelona to be so changing, so vibrant, so dynamic, yet it has this very constant sort of under undertone or undercurrent of very classical sort of um, practice of um, culinary dishes or ways of doing things. So you had to sort of think in the different levels, right? Um, and sort of see what tradition, how tradition coexists with all of these changes that are going uh, in, in, in each century or uh, in each sort of extended periods of time. Yes, in a certain way, the, the fact that there's the mountains and the sea, that is the basic, you know, in the, in the food of, of, of the region. Uh, uh, food at, that also in the dishes are, are mixed up. That is very unique. Food uh, mixed with fresh uh, 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 fish or, or um, sea fish, uh, which is something very, very common there, but very uncommon in other, in other culinary traditions. Uh, it's, and something that um, um, ha has not surprised, I, I knew that, but how uh, evident is, for example, the wine, uh, how we appreciate the wine nowadays and how it was in history. It was considered a stable food for the poor people, bread and wine. Wine nowadays is uh, just the contrary. It has evolved as something uh, uh, very, very special and uh, known for the humble people, most of the times is the contrary. But anyway, that is the, the good thing about uh, you discover new things, new approaches and the present and the, and the history. And that's what I like it most in, uh, in this book. Uh, Anna, another very interesting aspect analyzing it when we look at the book, is the, the development of cafes in the 19th century. Uh, Again, what is, was like this process, you explain very well in the book, uh, in the 19th century of the cafes, the explosion of cafes in, in, in Barcelona, and what remains today? This is very interesting because if we go back to the 19th century, um, remember, we remember Barcelona was preparing, it was 1888, and it was preparing for the um, Exposición Universal, the uh, first international world fair that was going to be held in the city. So at that time, the city was becoming rich. The, the art movements and architectural movements of El Modernismo uh, were, were evolving. And probably the fame of the city uh, that, that the city holds today was, was born uh, and achieved during, during that, that, that time, during the 19th century. And I think the cafes, are a reflection of that because um, first of all, we 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 imagine that at that time we already had the food that uh, we were already integrating the the new products from the new world, like the tomatoes, like chocolate. So in the cafes, you would mainly uh, drink more than coffee or tea, as we do nowadays. You would mainly drink chocolate. Chocolate was something very special, and it was something as as well that allowed women to gather together alone without the husbands in a cafe to be able to, you know, be with her, their friends and, and, and be alone, right? With one of, one of the only places they could be alone. We will find as well that at that period, same happens with the, with the Barcelona markets, uh, evolving a little bit more your question. That's when the Barcelona public markets uh, uh, start uh, to be built in Barcelona. Uh, with with uh, iron, beautiful iron structures with a, a very uh, unique architecture. They're now being restored in, in Barcelona. We have 39 public floor markets. Actually, 18 of them are, are have been restored, completely renovated. Uh, you can they have the look and feel of of when they when they were first built, beautifully restored, but inside. There is a complete renovation of the stalls. There is a complete renovation of the way of treating the food waste in a more sustainable and um, a more um, zero waste uh, uh, mindset. 
So that's also very interesting because the woman held a really important role then as well, because we have stalls that have been passed from families to families for over 30 years uh, or 40 years. And, and, and this woman that were first um, seen in the markets, they used to go and shop, but the owners of the stalls were also women. So another interesting part going together uh, with the Cafés Modernistas uh, in Barcelona that we can still, we can still uh, see and enjoy them. Some of them, to be honest, have been converted into Starbucks. We have to be honest here, but uh, most of them can still, so we can still enjoy. Uh, also, for example, Cuatragats, the probably the most emblematic one. I'm sure the participants here have visited Cuatragats. In Cuatragats, we can still find the first menu that Picasso would draw when he first moved to Barcelona. You can still see it there. Uh, it was a, a time where all the intellectuals would gather together. There was an art, uh, the artists would gather together in these cafes. And I think there's still this vibe and you can still feel it. And, you and the, the people still go to the cafes to, to meet and to discuss about uh, literature, writing and yes. spending hours there, yeah? Yes, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. And actually, Rosie, I think you will agree, we still, for example, as as authors and we have friends that are authors, we still reinforce this way of acting, going to present in these cafes or maybe, you know, gathering there for some students to do a master class. So, yeah, I think I think there's a still strong feeling that that, that persists. Yeah. Uh, we have the first question. Thank you very much. Susan asked it, uh, asked, uh, sorry, Antistre. I cannot hear where uh, I need my glasses. Um, the first question for both. Uh, for each of you, what is your favorite Catalan dish? Very difficult one. <laughs> Rosie, you go first. Yes, I guess I, I, I have to, right? Um, I have to say that um, one of the things that I enjoy the most is not so much the dish, but the how to, right? Uh, and I think this is one of the things that we talk a lot about, um, about Catalan food in, in our book and especially in the recipe um, chapter. The thing that I enjoy the most actually is the pam tomaca, you know, uh, this very simple way of uh, toasting bread, the bread that is, you know, it's, it's a few days old, right? So you are um, repurposing uh, bread. Um, you rub garlic if you want or not. You toast it, you rub some garlic and a tomato and you put olive oil and a couple of you know, a bit of salt and you just eat it. And I think it, it, the simplicity, right, of this um, little, it's not even a dish, right? It's just a bite that you eat. Um, it's just really, really good. And we actually call it the Catalan Madeline <laughs> because I think that uh, it, it is so significant in everyday eating and so it's such a staple in a Catalan uh, table uh, that is also very particular because you think, well, you cut the tomato and you eat it, but in this way, you actually squeeze the tomato juice and the flesh, but then you throw it away. So uh, it's really hard to explain that to somebody that does it for the first time as well. Um, and if I'm allowed, actually one, another dish that I enjoy a lot in Catalan cuisine is actually an adaptation of an Italian dish. I think that uh, a lot of the basic Catalan dish has to, Catalan cooking has to do with reusing, repurposing uh, whatever has been cooked. Um, and I think in that sense, the canelons are quite magnificent. Um, and I think that having cooked so much during this uh, year of the pandemic, I think that thinking about how to reuse things that we make, how we can take advantage of what we have in our kitchen, um, is really how Catalan basic cooking is about. And, and I really do enjoy it. Any, every instance of those kind of thinking about how to use and how to eat food. How about you, Anna? Linking to what you're saying, Rosie, mine would be, that it's also in the book, would be Ascudella y Carandolla. So linking to what she's saying, the, the, this dish that we usually eat on the Christmas day here in Catalonia, um, it's just for just if if some of the participants don't know it, 
So it is a soup, a broth made of um, uh, chickpeas as a vegetable, potatoes and uh, coles. Um, ¿Cómo serían coles? Uh, how do you cabbage. say coles? So like cabbage. cabbage kind of thing. Cabbage. Cabbage, exactly. Yeah. Cabbage. Thank you so much for your help. And uh, and different kinds of meat. And it's a long broth. You will bring it to boil for hours and hours. But it was the idea of the escudilla, which is the first recipe that we explain in the book. The foundation of this of this, this was as well what you had at that moment in your house and how to restore it. But it can be so delicious and you eat it in two parts. So you first eat the soup with the pasta, with the galettes, and then you eat the meat. In my taste, I usually mix it. I eat it in two parts, but then I mix the vegetables and some meat into the soup. And I, I find it, I love these dishes that you eat, that you can eat in many, many, many different ways as you like that day, right? It's always the same recipe, but uh, this richness and this freedom of eating it however you want. So this will probably be my favorite. And also it's my favorite as well, because being in California, I struggled but I made it exactly the way we made it in Catalonia. And I remember talking to Rosie, going to Whole Foods Market saying, okay, so peu de porc, uh, the, the uh, pig trotter, how can I find, maybe in a Mexican uh, supermarket, and I went to Mexican supermarket, so, but I could do it. So that was super interesting. Also a, a very fun part of our book, Rosie, I think you agree, was the huge cooking we did that those days to choose what recipes we included and how to adapt them because we were both living in the States at that time. And it was super interesting, yeah. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Victoria Montejano. She say, having such a rich food culture, why do you think there are no food technology classes in school or university? Mm -hmm. I would let Anna actually answer that one because I think it uh, pertains to Barcelona uh, first and then perhaps I can address it in a different way as well yeah food technology I guess uh, and I just to just to be clear I just I guess uh, the question refers to um, the techniques they use in health cuisine would that be the case maybe I, I don't know it's from the chat maybe uh, okay Victoria says no. Okay. Would would you would you be so kind, Victoria, to 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 um to explain a little bit more? Uh, maybe Victoria Montejano. Maybe uh, if you wish you can uh, ask in Spanish, and then okay. we will put it in English for the for the general audience because uh, food studies for uh, 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 Anna is not clear. Ah, I mean uh, studies in general. Studies in general. Food so our food, but uh, Anna, for example, you are a teacher in a food uh, university studies in Barcelona. Yes, yes. Victoria, you're very right. Um, there are more and more, it's growing, but it's true that the food studies as a, as a discipline, academic discipline, is wider and broader in the United States, for example. Rosie, you can add to this if, 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 if and correct me. But we're, we're noticing as authors of this book that it's, there is a lot of interest in our gastronomy, mainly out of our frontiers, so in, in internationally. And this gives us a big opportunity to explain ourselves because all the revolution and all the, the, the amazing um, uh, history, culinary history of, of Catalonia and Barcelona and, in, and Spain in general, it will not provide if we are not able to explain it, right? So we're finding a lot of food studies in the States. It's growing here in Spain, um, more to do about food critics, nutrition, nutritionismo. We have the Basque Culinary Center that, she, that Victoria Montejano is now appealing. Um, here in Barcelona, we have the Culinary Institute of Barcelona in Universitat de Batuliva and in CET, um, uh, there are two, one is a university and the other one is the School of, of, of Chefs. And they also have historical food studies. As in our site in Universidad de Barcelona, we teach about food and communication because we think we have to professionalize a little bit more this, this, this branch of, uh, of the industry in order to be able, as I was saying, to explain to the world what is happening here, the amazing wines we have. Um, if you notice the first, the wine region in Barcelona, 
is 40 minutes from the city. And some pay, it, it should be a must that when you visit Barcelona, you go to a winery and it, it sometimes doesn't happen. Most of the times. I, well, as when I was living in California, I lived in San Jose and Napa Valley was like three hours from home, but it was a must for me to go and explore the wine region. And everyone that, or most of the travelers that stay in one week in San Francisco would go to Napa Valley. And it's, you know, it's much more, it's, it's a long journey to go there. It's like three hours and you have to grab your car and blah, blah. While it's here, you can go with the train even. So I think it's a cultural thing that we have to manage to explain better, right? Yeah, and perhaps just to add to that answer, I think that um, from my perspective, um, seeing what Ana does in About Oliva and sort of seeing some of the programs, I think that historically the study of gastronomy has been very industry oriented. Uh, and it is certainly a field where you actually get trained by uh, doing apprenticeships, uh, working in kitchens and so on. Uh, and I think that writing about it then is very sort of media related. So then it would happen in sort of journalism or in, you know, in, in, in other disciplines. I think that food studies, as we understand it, is certainly a new field of inquiry, uh, even in other places, but especially in Spain. And I think that is sort of playing catch up with, with other uh, uh, places. But I think that also, um, in US academia and in UK and in other places as well, where there's a lot of interest in finding ways in which we actually make food um, a, a, and not an op only an object of study, but also research. Uh, it is a truly in interdisciplinary uh, field of studies where you uh, study history, uh, you also study um, politics, you can study nutrition, there is hard science, there are anthropology, there's so there's a lot of these disciplines that come together in food studies and it's very relevant to everyone, right? So and also recipe writing, recipe collecting, communities that are created by uh, cooking together or preserving uh, recipes and so on. So I think that it is an evolving um, area of studies. And I think that Spain will have to, it's, it's playing catch up in that sense. And hopefully uh, books like this and other initiatives, and there are book series that are actually very important in Spain. And unfortunately, some of the most important gastronomic manuscripts, for example, have no translation in English. And perhaps at some point, those could be translated into English. So there could be some more um, communication, right, and connection um, between what's going on in food studies outside of Spain, but also in Spain. So there is more opportunities uh, for instruction, education, and also new forms of working uh, with food. And I think in that sense, one good model is actually Fundacio Alicia, right? Uh, Fundacio Alicia outside of Barcelona is truly has become this research center in food studies and really pushing boundaries uh, in ways that we think about food um, as a transformative uh, player in how society deals with its elderly or uh, people with um, uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, issues or illnesses that you know they have allergens and 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 so on so it is really making food not only just something a uh, quotidian but something that actually matters in terms of, of of policy in terms of planning and so on so i think there's a lot to be done there yeah yes a lot of work to be done yet uh there is a question another for uh, tina longsdale she says, how do you cope with the variations of traditional receipts? Does everyone think that the way is the best way? Um, I think that in, in our choice, it was, how can you make a dish that you can actually make without being in Barcelona? I think that we were very aware of the fact that the uh, uh, audience, uh, the readership for this book was not Spanish, uh, that the person would be shopping in Sainsbury or Whole Foods or so on. So we really tried to make uh, the recipes accessible. In terms of traditional inversions, 
I think that uh, we really borrowed from a lot of recipes. Um, so you will see that in our collection we would say this recipe was inspired by all of these variations and whatever worked in either Anna's kitchen or my kitchen ended up uh, being included in the book. But also I think that it is really not a recipe book. Uh, we collect, we, we do a sample of about 10, but it's sort of a, to give you an idea of, of these dishes, right? But also the idea was to include dishes that you will find once you're in Barcelona in menus in a lot of places. So it's not something that is alien from your everyday experience, right? So we really were careful in choosing things that are still eaten, uh, that are current, that are accessible. And perhaps like any of these very traditional dishes, it really doesn't matter how things you change because basically they're very basic, right? <laughs> so a good suffragette, you know, good products, good ingredients. And you know, what is good is that it's fresh. You eat it with your family, uh, your mom makes it. Um, so there are a lot of more elements that go into enjoying and tasting food. Okay, I have one uh, question uh, that I, um, I would like to, to put you. Um, the avant-garde cuisine of uh, Ferran Adria, the Roca Brothers, and many others have followed it, then have made Barcelona one of the center of the world gastronomy. How do you, can you tell us about how was this process, this explosion of creativity, and what is the current situation, apart from the, the pandemic that has changed everything, but uh, uh, it was uh, something like, uh, as you mentioned, Anna, a real revolution in gastronomy, and, uh, but it's the details, maybe we don't really know so well. Shall I go for that one, Rosie? Yes, please, okay. go ahead. So um, the beginnings we can trace around 1976 with the first Mesa Redonda de la Gastronomía. At that time, we were out of, we, we, we were in the, we, the war had finished, la gastronomía in Spain was, you know, very, it, we were losing, we, 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 we were losing recipes, we were losing diversity and the chefs were really worried. So because of the proximity to France where Nouvelle Cuisine had evolved and the French cuisine, as you know, Nouvelle Cuisine has traveled the world. But if you see in the map, Catalonia, the Northern part of Catalonia, Lampurda, Figueras, after Rosas were, were where uh, Calamon Joy, where, where Fran Adria would open, where Fran Adria would, would evolve his kitchen in El Bulli. Um, that two, those two areas, País Vasco, the Basque country, and Catalonia were, were the closest ones to the border of France. So the chefs would, would start traveling to France to try to learn what was going on with Nouvelle Cuisine, what was so special about Nouvelle Cuisine. But uh, they, 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 they saw that it was based on products, but it, it had a lot of um, sophistication in the terms of a lot of uh, sauces, uh, butter uh, that would cover the product. So the first thing they would, mm, they would try to do was base it in more fresh, uh, uh, simple products. At that time, it, it, you couldn't imagine to have a, a, a plate of a dish of a fish, a grilled fish, and vegetables. In, in Nouvelle Cuisine, the fish would be right there with a super thick sauce and the vegetables would only decorate, right? So bringing it to our landscape, bringing it to like Josep Pla, the author would say, el paisaje posat al plat in Catalan, the landscape put in your dish. We were, I think, first of all, the chefs were very conscious about this and they tried to put this landscape in the dish but in a very creative way, thinking out of the box. So what happened was exactly this, that they started trying to think different. And one of the things that made Ferran Adria so special, and I've always asked this question to all the chefs. Uh, yesterday I read uh, a very nice book from Jose Andres 
Uh, and he says, one of the things I learned in Albuji is to think, is there any other way that I can cook this ingredient? Is there any other way that this dish can be presented? Is there any other, can this be cold when it's normally served hot? So just to think in a very uh, alternative or, or lateral way. And um, also the phrase that, that Fran Adria heard from Jacques Maximin when he went to the hotel in Cannes, his, his hotel in Cannes, very, a very, Hotel Royal, a very famous hotel. He said, to create is not to copy. And Nouvelle Cuisine is based on copying recipes. It's exactly the contrary. So what they started doing here was th rethinking all the bases that they knew. Nouvelle Cuisine would be the base, yes, but they would rethink it, evolve it, and transform it. So that's very resumed, very um, briefly, what, what, could, what, what I could add to, to this question. And the, the work is on progress. Still nowadays, exactly. uh, it's experiment, experimenting with ingredients, exactly. with the ways, the presentation, every everything is being rethinked yes. and uh, remade. I and think perhaps, now yeah, some yeah. very important okay. thing is changed. Oh, sorry, Rosie. No, it's just one quick thing to add in that sense. I think that, and one of the things that we remark in the book is that because of the fame of these chefs that you mentioned, uh, Pedro. Um, there's a lot of apprentices uh, from the world passing through Spanish cuisines, uh, the kitchens, uh, Spanish kitchens, right? In the Basque country, in Madrid, in Barcelona, and so on. And a lot of these chefs have also been able to open restaurants in different points of uh, different parts of the world. So I think that is not only happening uh, in Catalonia or in Spain, sort of this revolu this, this uh, gastronomic revolution, but it will have a long-term consequence because anybody that is anyone in the industry or is interested about food has Spain as a reference at this point <laughs> and will at some point or another make it through Spain or you will find a lot of chefs that have done uh, stints in Spanish kitchens. So I think in that sense, it's more sort of the influence that you can think about when you think about the significance of uh, chefs like Ferran Adria or the uh, Can Roca uh, brothers uh, achieving uh, world uh, fame. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, this time from uh, Esther Jimeno. She says, thanks for the beautiful presentation. You mentioned public municipal markets before. I was curious to know if you also include some reflections in your book addressing the relations between food markets and urban chase in Barcelona. For example, motors of gentrification. I'm thinking, for instance, on the Mercat La Boqueria of Sant Antonio. Uh, definitely. I think that is the base of one of our chapters. Uh, and I will tell, actually, let Anna address um, sort of the newer um, um, uh, dynamics that is happening with uh, the association of, of, of markets in Barcelona. But definitely in a historical uh, sense, uh, the chapter uh, in the, on, on the markets actually in the book traces the story, right, for the first time, where does the space uh, comes to uh, actually build these markets, right? So uh, how does hunger, political um, revolution and uh, protest and the burning of the convents and so on create spaces actually to build these markets? Uh, why, for example, uh, vendors are put into these markets and not outside. Uh, it turns has to do with hygiene, but it also has to do with the language that these ladies use and so on. So there's definitely a relationship between uh, the physical construction of the markets, but also how markets become cent uh, central in the organization of these neighborhoods. So definitely we do trace that story. And it's really interesting because it's an ongoing relationship between the market and its neighborhood and its area. And I think Anna has a lot more insight about that uh, going ongoing relationship between the market and the city. Yes. Thank you, Rosie. It's true that um, it's a very good question. Um, 
it's it's um it's um it's a very interesting public and private model and it's strategic for uh the government of barcelona because it, as I said in the beginning, it preserves a Mediterranean way of life. It's not only a place where you go and shop, it's a place where you relate to other people. Maybe if you're living alone at your home or with the pandemic, it's the only place where you go and relate to others uh, a week. They have played such an important role, these public markets um, during the pandemic because what they have done is that the stalls were open and providing, it's like a circle, as we were saying in the beginning, um, the markets assured that the city was uh, had the fresh, fresh food for the city over the century, but it also assured now with the pandemic, the same thing, the same thing. And also they have people that were confined back home or people that maybe they were, um, elderly that couldn't leave home because they were afraid they would call to the stall of the market their usual stall ask them what they wanted and when the stall closed in the afternoon they would go and bring it to their homes this is a a, 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 a social um way of 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 mm, it's a social way of life as well right uh it's a, also a social business itself uh we're talking that the 39 markets have a turnover of 950 million euros per year. So imagine it's, we're talking about 39 markets. Barcelona has 1,600,000, 1, 1,600,000 residents right now, um, just to be able to have the picture. And 7,500 employees uh, are employed in this 39 market. So it's huge, it's huge. We have to think Right now, the, the central uh, warehouse of Amazon that's about to open will have 50 employees and will give um, it, the service to this same population, right? So it's a really important role they play, a really important role. And it's been like this since they were born over the years, right? So I think this is super interesting. Also, if some people think, okay, and talk about gentrification, there is a challenge because, for example, in La Boqueria, which is probably the market that you recognize the most. Raval has a plan to be pedestrian, but if we want people from the city to go down to La Boqueria and be able to park underneath La Boqueria, as if one of the, the renovations of the market is that they all have a parking underneath or right beside, so you can go and park your car and you don't have to carry your bag all over. So this is one of the challenges, right? How the city evolves in mobility, for example, no? And uh, at, at, at the same time, you still have the facility to go down to La Boqueria because going to La Boqueria for us, for Catalan, is a, a prestigious thing. So if in my, in, my, in my Christmas table, I say this fish, I've been shopping in La Boqueria and I brought this, this seafood from La Boqueria and it's like, wow, you know, it's like something that you go to this gourmet market. La Boqueria is not for tourists, or like most of the people think. It's really a tradition of a lot of the chefs still go and buy there. A lot of the chefs still go and have breakfast in the little bars that are in La Boqueria. You can see Pinocho, he's almost 87 years old and you can still see him cooking in his little uh, stall in his little bar inside La Boqueria. So it's a very popular thing for us, the citizens in Barcelona too. Uh, but of course, in this, this is a challenge and also to try to preserve the local products and also the local recipes instead of selling the pitaya from Thai Thailand or the super colorful fruits that are not from our country, but they that are appealing to people that visit our city is another challenge. How to stay local thinking globally. Thank you. Um, there are people, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. It was very interesting and very inspiring. And yes, many congratulations. We are happy. Thank you. Uh, the beginning of our talk, uh, my introduction, uh, one of the aims of this delicioso, delicious program is also to support the, the people from the, from the gastronomy, from the industry, who are suffering a lot uh, with the pandemic. And uh, 
I would like to both uh, to put the question, um, how are the chefs, the restaurants, the people from the gastronomy sector in, in Barcelona, how they had adapt and had, are surviving the, the, the pandemic? Anna, I think that that one also is you because you're uh, in the ground, you're in ground zero right now. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rosie. Um, well, m most of the restaurants have done a big, big effort to adapt to uh, delivery, takeaway. I'm talking about high-end restaurants, like for example, to put an example, a two Michelin star restaurant would never think in his mind he would do delivery. Right, and with the pandemic, they've done a big effort to adapt, to adapt also to their purpose, to take the experience of their restaurant home through the packaging, through the presentation of the dishes, through the facility of just very easy indications of you eat it three minutes in the microwave. It's not easy. Some 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 dishes are not easy to travel, even in a city. Right, they have done a big big effort to 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 keep up active, to be close to their diners. And also, you know, cooking for most of, their, of them is not only their, their way of living, it's their real passion. So one of the things, one of the, I think the saddest things is to see all these chefs, um, you know, saying, I need to come go back to cooking. I need to go back to cooking because it's my life, right? So I think it's going to, be the, the, the ones that are surviving uh, has been through a big effort in, in these two senses and a business oriented and also in a way of, of um, resistance, of resilience, right? Re uh, and now I think we're seeing um, a group of, res of, of uh, chefs that are willing also to adapt to new needs. For example, when Ferran Adria had El Bulli open, he used to cook, uh, he used to buy, and we explained it in the book, seven kilos of product and serve 700 grams of product in the 35 course menu that would last for six hours. This is unbearable now. This is something you can't imagine now. They're all thinking about zero food waste. It is, it is something that they not, they not only do, but they explain in their menus. So they are trying to adapt to these times that, uh, that demand more sustainability in the way of producing, the way of consuming, the, the, the local products that we now consume, we used to always say, oh, we're eating kilometro cero. We're eating from local producers. Uh, now it's a real necessity to help them. So now it's something that we have in our veins after the pandemic. And it's something that is also, you can see the evolution in the restaurants as well. Um, so I see more and more changes to come and a lot of happiness and excitement to go to the street. Like for example, now it's 8.15. And if when we finish, I want to go and, and drink a caña, a little cerveza, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> First time after, I don't know how many months. <laughs> yeah, well, it proves that the, the, the cuisine, the gastronomy, the food is sharing, is like in your book. That uh, you, uh, there are made a lot of comments. You can also, for those who, who want to to read it, we will have in the our library in Cervantes, Manchester, and Leeds. But the passion for food, the passion for gastronomy, cultures is here, and uh, I think you have transmitted that, that very well. Thank you very much, Rosie, Anna. My congratulations from the people to you and uh, the Santiago Falls, our friend from the University of of Doran say that the president has made me hungry. It's true, but also I hope an appropriate compliment for both book and presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.